why you should think twice about attached garages. I should begin by stating that over the course of my career, I have never, ever, not even once, gotten a client to reconsider having an attached garage. People who like them, like them. That said, I do still think it's valuable to discuss some of the reasons why they're so ill-advised so that we can better detail them. Before discussing garages though, I'd like to discuss leaks actually, because the principles of water management are surprisingly similar to managing pollutants in our buildings. When I teach about leaks, I know that a leak has four elements and without any one of them, we don't actually have a leak. A leak requires a source of water, obviously. It requires a pathway for that water to travel from where it is to where we don't want it to be. It requires a driving force to push water along that pathway. And it requires something to be damaged as a result or someone to be annoyed. This is a particularly helpful way for a professional to understand leaks because it permits us to consider a variety of design responses. We can practice source control, essentially by limiting the amount of water that reaches a critical interface, for example. We can seal the pathways that we can seal. We can reduce the driving forces, perhaps by providing drainage. And we can minimize the use of moisture sensitive materials, or we can design in such a way that provides enhanced drying so that when our building materials get a bit wet, they can dry quickly enough to avoid becoming damaged. When dealing with leaks, we make a mistake when we focus exclusively on sealing the pathways or potential pathways for water. All of the design responses on this list are important and merit our attention. None is more valid or more important than another. Water management in architecture depends and has always depended on all four of these elements. To my knowledge, I'm the first one to teach about leaks in this way by identifying these four elements individually. But would you like to know where I got the idea from? I adapted this approach from how my father, who's a wonderful building scientist, teaches about indoor air quality. I thought, why not look at water the same way we look at pollutants? An indoor air quality problem requires a pollutant, it requires a pathway for that pollutant to travel from where it is to where we don't want it to be. It requires a pressure to push the pollutant along that pathway. And it requires people who can become sick in uh, more extreme cases or annoyed in more mild cases, perhaps by just an offensive but otherwise harmless odor. When dealing with pollutants, we have similar categories of design responses. We can practice source control. This has been a really big focus of our profession for the past 20 years. And we've been quite successful about eliminating many of the most harmful chemicals that we introduce into our interior environments. An attached garage provides us with a giant source of pollution. My recommendation to eliminate attached garages altogether falls into this category of action but it's not the only design response available to us. Let's continue going through our, uh, our list. We can seal the pathways between the pollutant and the people. We can reduce or eliminate the pressures that might push the pollutant along those pathways. And we can remove people from the environment. This last one is obviously an extreme response, but it's one that we do indeed take when a pollutant is bad enough and we've failed at any of the other options. So let's continue our discussion of attached garages using this list as a guide. Suppose we're not gonna eliminate the attached garage and we're not gonna remove the people from the environment. And that leaves us with two things to consider, pathways and pressures. Now, just as with water management, we tend to obsess over the pathways and the pathways are really, really important but dealing with the pressures tends to be more important in pollution control. Even when we're excellent at sealing the pathways, it's usually not enough to compensate for not getting the pressure relationships right. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves here. Let's look at the typical attached garage and talk about the pathways. Here's an image of a simple attached garage what we want is to treat the walls that separate the garage from the house as though they were exterior walls from an air sealing perspective. 
What's difficult is that we're so used to pursuing water management and air management together that conceptually this can be really hard for us. These interior garage walls are not exposed to wetting and air control without the water control component often just isn't on our radar. So how do we achieve the separation we need? There's really nothing magic. We typically just use drywall, sealant, and sometimes also spray foam. Although I should note that while spray foam can be an excellent tool as part of a larger air sealing strategy, it cannot actually seal where it has not been applied. In any case, where we often go wrong in attached garages is in failing to recognize that walls have a thickness to them and we don't want to connect the cavity between both sides of a wall to the living space. The same is true of ceilings. So we want to be especially attentive above the garage ceiling and on the other side of the drywall used to finish the garage. Let's just look at this one corner condition as an example. This is not from the same project, but the condition is the same. This contractor has used zip sheathing above the ceiling plane to isolate the garage from the house. He has also applied foam over the studs to act as a kind of gasket for the drywall to help with air sealing. What he hasn't yet done is seal this stud bay here. Now you could argue that the framing itself is fairly good at separating the exterior garage wall from the exterior house wall, but what are the odds we'll have electrical penetrations in the garage wall that require drilling holes through these studs? It's best to seal this up anyway. And speaking of penetrations, these garage to house conditions typically have tons of them. Our second problem is making sure that these penetrations are sealed. This isn't intuitively very complicated. We know how to seal penetrations. What's difficult is that construction involves coordinating among lots of different trades, and it's very common for this work to be covered up and concealed from view before all the penetrations have been sealed. In other words, attached garages require a high level of competence and organization on the part of the contractor. Okay, so that's the pathway component to attached garages. Let's talk about the pressure component. For this, it helps to distinguish between mechanical conditioning and mechanical ventilation. When we mechanically condition our house, when we heat it or cool it, it looks something like this. We have an air handler that delivers conditioned air to the spaces in our house through what we call supply ducts. And then we have return ducts that take air from the space and deliver it back to the air handler to be conditioned again. What's important to note is that this is a closed loop. It's just a continuous cycle. There isn't a provision to introduce new, fresh exterior air to the space. When we talk about ventilation, we're concerned with air exchange between the interior and the exterior. So how are we introducing fresh air into our homes? For airflow to occur, we need a pathway or opening connecting two points, and we need an air pressure difference between the two points. So pathways and pressures, this should be familiar to us. In houses, the pathways are defects in our air barrier and the pressures are wind, stack, and mechanical pressures. Pressure relationships in buildings can get complicated pretty quickly, and if you're interested in indoor air quality and would like a more comprehensive but simple and straightforward discussion of this topic, I encourage you to check out my course on residential ventilation. But for the purposes of this discussion on attached garages, we're gonna ignore wind and stack pressures and just deal with mechanical pressures. The most common approach to mechanical ventilation in homes is called exhaust only ventilation. What we'll do is we'll have a fan somewhere in the house that runs on some kind of schedule, often it's a bathroom fan, that exhausts air to the exterior. And that's it. And when it does that, exhaust air to the exterior, it creates a negative pressure inside the occupied space and that negative pressure induces exterior air to infiltrate through some defect in the enclosure to make up for the air that was exhausted. Air out equals air in. So that's where our fresh air comes from, which is to say that we have no idea where our fresh air is coming from. That makeup air could be coming from an open window 
or it could be coming from a poorly sealed plumbing penetration, or it could be coming from an attached garage, and that's a problem. We should note here that bathroom fans aren't the only fans that exhaust air to the exterior. Dryers vent to the exterior, so do fireplaces, so do a lot of furnaces, and so do those giant commercial grade range hoods that have become so popular in custom homes. Now, all of these appliances can cause massive negative pressures, and we typically don't exercise a whole lot of control over where that makeup air comes from. I should note that this is a problem regardless of whether or not we have an attached garage. In failing to control the air that we introduce into our interior environment, we permit the introduction of other pollutants into our space like dust and allergens. We can also lose control over interior relative humidity, which has indoor air quality, comfort, and, uh, and durability implications. So what should we do? We ought to exercise better control over the pressure relationships in our homes by providing balanced ventilation instead of exhaust-only ventilation. I recommend using an ERV, energy recovery ventilator, to introduce a known amount of exterior air into our enclosures from a known source. And I recommend providing dedicated, filtered, and humidity-controlled makeup air for each appliance that will be exhausting air to the exterior. Now, I realize that what started as a discussion on attached garages has concluded with a recommendation to not just avoid attached garages, but to completely reconsider how our homes are ventilated. And what I've just recommended, balanced ventilation instead of exhaust-only ventilation, represents a huge design change with substantial cost implications. But there you have it. Over the past 20 years, we've made significant advances in how well we detail the pathways through our enclosures. And that's great. Our residential buildings are more comfortable and energy efficient than ever. The next step for us is to get a better handle on pressure relationships in our buildings. We've touched on indoor air quality, which is, I think, the main reason to do this but the way we ventilate our buildings also has important durability and energy implications as well. The switch from exhaust-only ventilation to balanced ventilation will not be a small step. It's an enormous step, and it's going to be really challenging for us, but I think we're up for it. If you're game, I hope you'll consider taking my course on residential ventilation. It's not for mechanical systems designers, and there's no prerequisites for the course. It's for architects and builders to help them understand what to ask from their mechanical systems designer and what ultimately they ought to be recommending to their clients.